Hello everyone and welcome. I'm Dr. Lurie Kiley and I come to you today from the beautiful foothills of the Sierra Mountains. I hope you and your family and your loved ones are all safe and feeling protected out there. It's a pretty interesting time, isn't it? Everyone is being affected by this in one way or another. And a lot of people are feeling pretty stuck. They don't quite know how to go forward and they're pretty sure they can't go backwards. And so today what we're going to talk about is leading from the future. We're going to talk about how to shape the future as it comes. And hopefully this will give you some tools to see where things are going and to try to keep up with that and try to be in front of change this time instead of just behind it and reacting to it. So let's get started. This comes to you as a part of a series called the new R&R, the new R&R meaning readiness and resilience, which add up with these two skill sets together, add up to being more robust as individuals and as organizations. How can we get in front of change is our subject today. There are three parts to this particular series. One of them has to do with seeding the future, which is today's work. There's another in the series called leadership and work and how to manage people who are working virtually. And then the third part of the series is self-care. And hopefully you get a chance to see all three. Nancy Levin put out one of the most brilliant quotes that I've ever seen around this time right now that we are all living through. She says, to honor the space between the no longer and the not yet. You think about that space where we are living right now. We know things are, a lot of things will be no longer. We don't even know what all. We don't know what's coming. We don't know the not yet. But she says to honor this space. And I think it's an important concept to think about rather than being tortured by it or afraid of it or pretending like it doesn't exist, if we honor this space, we may be able to use it to our benefit. It reminds me a little bit of you know, the choices that we have about being an optimist or a pessimist and so on. You might remember the story about the optimist and the pessimist. Ronald Reagan gets credit for this. I'm not sure if he's the one that invented the story, but they brought the pessimist into a room full of ponies and he said, oh man, this is no good at all. It's just gonna be full of manure pretty soon. And then they brought the optimist into a room full of manure and the optimist said, oh wow, this is great. There's probably a pony in here somewhere. So I'm asking you to suspend the angst and the anxiety and the frustration and even some of the anger that everyone is feeling right now. And let's just think a little bit more like optimists, at least for a few moments so we can capture how our brain can work better in optimism. I would also add, if you study any of the information, the studies that have been done in healthcare around optimists, we found out some interesting things about optimists or behaving like an optimist, and that is that they live longer, but not only do they live longer, they actually have more fun and they have happier lives. So it's worth trying sometimes. Let's think in terms of the optimist today. I am also seeing a lot of people get very, very uh, paralyzed or, or just stuck by everything that's going on out here. And I want to show you a little video so I can uh, show you what, it, it's an old Canadian advertisement that I think kind of captures the way people are not only feeling but behaving today. So let me show you this one. Late. Somebody will come. Anybody out there? Do you have a phone? No. Sorry. Somebody! Hello! There are two people stuck on an escalator and we need help. Now, would somebody please do something? Don't believe this. You gotta be kidding me. <laughs> I'm gonna cry. <laughs> well, there's not enough left to do. So. Hello? Hey, don't worry about it. 
Well, I'll fix it in a second. <laughs> he said he can fix it. <laughs> All right. All right. That's more like it. He says he can fix it. So I bring this to you. So I ask you if you've been seeing that or if you've been feeling that way or even behaving that way. My question to you is, can I give you some tools that can help you cope with this situation a little bit better? And I have to be really honest with you. I, I don't think in this country we've been given very or have been developing very good coping skills. We've had a lot of things easy for a lot of us. And when it comes to something really as disastrous as a pandemic, we don't have the coping skills. We haven't really developed them. So let me see if I can give you a few that can not only help you as an individual, but can help you in an organization and you as a leader to move things forward in a way that actually doesn't keep people stuck, but also doesn't make necessarily bad moves in the, in the new direction. There's been a lot of talk about resilience. I'm sure you see in your emails every single day. I can't believe how many people are talking about resilience right now. Resilience is, let's talk about the definition of resilience. Resilience is the art of bouncing back. But my question to you is bouncing back to what? Do we really want to bounce back or are we even going to be capable of bouncing back to where we were? Or would we rather think about how to leap forward? So I think that maybe if we spend a little time looking at the word resilience and being careful of that, because here's Webster's definition of resilience. It's the capability of a strained body to recover its size and shape after deformation caused especially by, by compressive stress. Well, that's sort of about what happens to a thing and how it gets, it's whether or not it's resilient. But that sort of feels like that right now in terms of human beings are we're being deformed because of compressive stress. Second definition is what he means about human beings, an, an ability to recover from or adjust easily to misfortune or change. That's where we are right now. But it's an ability to recover from or adjust easily to, it's about bouncing, bouncing back. I want to spend some time with you talking about leaping forward instead. There's too much emphasis on resilience, and that has to do with can we recover, can we get back to the shape that we were in in the first place? The answer to that is probably no. We don't know what's coming. We don't know how things are going to turn out, but I can tell you this much. There's a lot of things, there are a lot of things that are not going to be around anymore or the way they used to be. So they're not gonna just bounce back to the same old shape we were in before. Let's reframe the question then. Might we get better answers if we ask a slightly different question? So here's my question to you. Where are we really? Are we behind an event reacting to what has happened to us, which is resilience and trying to respond to it, trying to bounce back to the way we were? Or are we in front of a whole new world? And are we helping shape what is coming? That's called readiness. And I wanna talk about the readiness model of the new R&R as opposed to the resilience model. By the way, remember the old R&R, it was rest and recuperation. That's not what this one's about. Are we poised on the threshold of what will or what can be? And are we taking care of this opportunity to significantly improve it? This opportunity, this opportunity that Levin talks about in terms of being in that space between the no longer and the not yet. This opportunity to be optimists whenever humanly possible to try to find the pony in there somewhere. Let's, if we reframe the question, perhaps we can reframe the tools that we're using to get through all of this. For example, one of the tools that we know we have to use more effectively is the tool of just very simply standing in the balcony and getting out of the dance. Can we take ourselves out of this complexity, look at it with new eyes and see it from the balcony and find the patterns in that dance so that we will know what to shift and what might be coming and what we might change in order to make the future okay. You cannot find the patterns in the dance when you're in the dance. So in order to see them effectively, we really have to go to the balcony. So today, what I'm going to talk to you about has to do with seven things. In order to leap forward, here are some things we might try. In fact, 
it should give them to you this way. What should tomorrow's logic be? Should, how should we be seeing things? What should we shift? So number one is we need to get a handle on fear. So we'll start there today. Number two, we're gonna talk about avoid, uh, how to avoid building in bad habits right now just to get by. This is a cautionary tale I want to talk about with you today. I'm going to talk about how to unlearn some old beliefs and paradigms. We're going to look with new eyes. We're going to learn to anticipate. We're going to talk about using integrated thinking. And we're going to talk about shifting our focus more toward meaning and purpose and not entirely toward just getting her done. So that's where we're going today. We're going to talk about these few things. So number one, let's get a handle on fear. Behind almost every single solitary, unpleasant human emotion is fear. It comes from our primitive part of our brain at the back of the stem of our, of our brain stem. And it was there from the very beginning of, of humans and homo sapiens. It was there for a very good reason in, in the origin of our species, because we had to immediately sense fear all around us at all times just to make sure there's no saber-toothed tiger sitting behind a tree ready to eat us up. But we don't have saber-toothed tigers anymore. Now we have much more complex and many things are very invisible that can actually be creating threat for us. The likely responses we have when we feel fear is fight, flight, freeze, denial, or doing just enough to get by. The fight response is maybe yours. Think about what your, what your typical response would be to these kinds of things and to fear. Is it fight? Do you get kind of angry when you get scared? Or is it flight? Do you just want to say, get me out of here? Or is it freeze? Or you just think, I, bouncing against the wall and go, I don't know what to do with myself? Or is it denial, just pretending like it doesn't exist? Or are you just putting one foot in front of the other, trying to get by and just make it to the other side? when frankly, we don't know when the other side is going to occur and what it's going to look like. But these are the likely responses to fear. These are not the best use of our brain when it comes to planning and imagining and solving problems. That part of the brain is called the prefrontal cortex, the executive function of the brain. In evolution studies, it, it shows that that part of the brain was developed in human beings later but if the only thing is being triggered is the fear response, then the front end, the front executive function, isn't invited to the party and doesn't show up unless we intentionally invite it to join us. So today is a lot about intentionally inviting people to join us because fear is not a good decision maker. Fear makes us, first of all, think of ourselves first because we're in survival mode. You know, it's like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, the base level of our lives of, and the situations of our needs has to do with foundationally, we have to first of all, feel like we can survive. And that's where a lot of people are right now, justifiably so. But when we think we're in survival mode, whether we are realistic or not, we think of ourselves first. It's a natural human condition. But it's a little bit like that old joke right now about, you know, Steve and Mark are camping and when a bear comes out growls at them. Steve starts putting on his tennis shoes. And Mark says, what the heck are you doing? You can't outrun a bear. And Steve says, I don't have to outrun the bear. I just have to outrun you. That's the kind of thinking that people get into when fear is the main motivator for their thought. So what we have to do is shift that. But we have to do it intentionally. It's not our strong suit. What we need to be doing is thinking in the bigger picture, using the executive function of our brain, and seeding the future is about thinking in those kinds of terms. So you might even want to pause every now and then in this program and take down some notes or think about what we're talking. So feel free to put pause on the recording that you have, but think about yourself. What do you think is going on? How are you responding? Which of those things are you feeling most of all? Fight, flight, freeze, denial, just getting by, just putting in the time? Or are you spending some good high energy thinking about how you can shape the future to make it effective and responsible and happy for everybody? How is your team re work responding? How is your organization responding? Think about this for a second and try to take notes on what's the feeling that you get 
around you. And if part of what you're feeling is that people are fe feeling such fear that they're feeling really angry and frustrated and irritable, you might be noticing, I certainly am, I work with every imaginable industry all over the world right now, and uh, I'm noticing that if you just scratch the surface a little bit, the emotions are very raw and they're very close to the surface. Easy to make people cry, easy to make people get angry, to get irritable. I mean, these are the ways that people are behaving in a lot of ways. Catherine Marshall, way back in the 50s, said this incredible quote that I can remember from reading it when I was just a kid, saying, a clenched fist is in no position to accept anything. And it doesn't matter if that fist is clenched in anger or just piteously trying to clutch the past. So we're going to have to open our hands, open our minds, and open our hearts to be able to navigate this new world and help shape it rather than just being shaped by it. That's yesterday's thinking. One of the things I ask you that is, do you think this will successfully take you into an unknown future? The way you're experiencing things right now, the way you are feeling in your team and in your organization, do we need to build some discipline in so that this will take us into the future in a much more effective way? Or do you think the way things are going will take you into that future effectively? I think not. I think we have to get rid of yesterday's thinking and probably move in the direction of a variety of things. One of those being, let's be careful. Let's be very, very careful in our organizations and avoid creating new and bad habits in your culture just because you're trying to get by. This is a very, very precious time and a dangerous time because we can start building in repetitive behaviors that become habitual and then become norms. And then we have really done damage to the culture of our organization. So don't just try to get by. Strive to be awesome. No matter what, strive to be awesome. You'll have bad days. But at least most of the time, set the intention to strive for best imaginable. We also have to have some systems awareness here. Because what I was saying about being careful of these bad habits being built in, Peter Drucker said many years ago, a very, very powerful quote, where he said, culture eats strategy for breakfast. And what he means by that is it doesn't matter how much you sit down and think about all the right things to do and have this beautiful strategy and everything all set up. If your culture is not ready for it, if it is not willing to implement this, if it cannot work within that context, your culture is stronger than anything. And it is stronger than any kind of new strategy. So be careful today about not building in bad habits. Because it's a VUCA world, according to the military, Military calls it a VUCA world, meaning it's volatile, it's uncertain, it's complex, and it has a lot of ambiguity in it. That's been true since before the coronavirus, though. It's been operating like this for a very long time. Now it's just on steroids. So the third strategy here for making sure we can shape the future instead of being just shaped by it is to unlearn and abandon some old paradigms and beliefs. I call old beliefs ghosts. It stands for gripping habits and old suspicious truths. Maybe it's time to surface some of those and see if they're really real, or maybe it's time to even unlearn them. Here are a couple of them. I keep getting calls from clients saying, we can't do this in the future because we're not going to have enough budget. We're not going to have enough money. First of all, they say that. Then they say, well, we aren't going to have enough human resources. We can't hire all the people back. We can't hire the people that we need. We're going to have to run on a leaner team. Let me point out to you that one of the thinking systems that we need to shift is we need to shift from thinking that money and resources are the solutions to everything. In fact, time is the new currency, not money. We, used to, we have to use it wisely. We have to use it effectively and efficiently. And resources, the most important resource we have available to us today, is not throwing tons and tons of things or buildings or people at it, but innovation. So time is the new currency, and innovation is the new resource. If you don't have money, you don't have human resources, you don't have all the tools you need, you do have time, let's use that as currency, and you do have innovation, and that's the new resource. That solves just about anything. 
Uh, Peter Drucker also said at one point that the greatest danger in the times of turbulence is not the turbulence. The greatest danger is to act with yesterday's logic. So again, I go back to will yesterday's thinking get us into tomorrow? Here's one of my fun favorite ways to explain. Watch out for yesterday's logic. You may have seen this. It's a, it's a wonderful series of photographs that are attributed to a fellow named Nicholas. I don't know if he put them together or not, but they're really fascinating about using yesterday's logic. What you can't see down in the lower left corner is there's a car in the water down there. It went over the, over the edge there and it went down in the water. And we discovered leverage hundreds of years ago, right? So yesterday's logic is, and still typically what we do, is if we want to lift something, we have to have a lever. We have to put a lever out, attach it to what we want to lift, and then just tip it, lift it up. Perfect. Old logic seems to still work. Not exactly, because this world becomes more complex. A couple of things that are problematic about this. One is, first of all, if you're really using lever, it has to be level not tipped down toward the object that you're lifting because that could easily pull down the lever. There's another set of situations here that nobody's taking into account, and that is that that car is full of water and its weight is shifting and some of the water is pouring out. So it's not just something to pick up that has a steady weight and the lever is tipped down. So, hmm. but yesterday's logic says you want to lift something, find a lever. The problem with that is it may not work based on today's level of complexities. But here's what human beings tend to do. When the, the original yesterday's thinking didn't work, then we just bring in something bigger. Let's bring in a bigger crane. If that didn't work, just make it bigger and better, but not different. So now we bring in a bigger crane. That's yesterday's logic on steroids. Pulls out the car, Pulls, starts to pull out the other crane because now we've got a huge problem with the big crane down there, but we got a bigger crane, all is cool. On the other hand, do we never learn? So it's a beautiful example of sometimes the turbulence is not the tur is the problem. Sometimes the problem is us using yesterday's logic. And I promise you today that in this stage between the not yet and the no, no longer that I think we need to pay attention to using yesterday's logic a little too much. So that argues in favor of another tool I want to talk to you about, which is let's try looking with new eyes. Marcel Proust said once that the real voyage of discovery consists not in seeking new landscapes, but in having new eyes. This is a lot to ask of people because our brains typically go to the past to make sense out of the present. And we make comparisons out of the past to the present. So we rarely ever see anything as fresh and new. We see it by comparison to other things we've experienced in the past. But how about if we start mixing a little realism with a little optimism and see if that recipe can't get us somewhere. Especially when we're working in a world of emergent seas. And we are and we have been for quite some time. Emergent seas have certain characteristics. We've never exactly been in this situation before. We're not sure what the problem or issue really is. We don't know what the possible solutions might be. We've never worked with this configuration of people before. We don't really know each other, how each person thinks, what they've experienced, what they think the rules are. That's an emergent C. And what we're doing in emergent Cs is co-creating. Now, co-creation goes way beyond cooperation and collaboration. Those are nice to have, but those are way too soft. Co-creation demands way more rigor. It demands way better tools for people to come together and create reality. This isn't about cooperating with somebody else's idea. This is about inventing things together. We're making stuff up together. Now, group sense making, we have to get more disciplined about how people interact with information. Better critical thinking, frankly. And we have to interact with each other much more effectively as well. And then we can end up with better outcomes that are in the best interest of all people, not just one group or another. Because co-create is the ability of groups of people to optimally structure reality together, especially when they disagree or come at things from different perspectives. Believe it or not, this is unbelievably powerful and doable 
but it takes a different skill set than what we have right now, and it takes a different set of coping skills. So to quote my favorite, favorite, favorite philosopher of all time, Jimmy Buffett, who said, life is more manageable when thought of as a scavenger hunt, as opposed to a surprise party. <laughs> I love that quote. Scavenger hunt, as opposed to a surprise party. Surprise party is very, very different. The scavenger hunt is the readiness model. And we did a seven year study in my organization internationally. We interviewed hundreds of people in multiple different languages to find out what are the attributes of a human being or an organization or a community that is ready for anything. And it was a fascinating study. I'm not going to tell you all the details of it, but it has to do with the coping skills that we have to have when we're in front of change rather than behind it. That's resilience and readiness is in front. The advantage to being in front of change, the readiness model, the scavenger hunt model, where we're looking for the possibilities instead of just waiting to see what they're going to be. The beauty of that is being in front of the change means that we have some ability to influence the way it turns out. Being behind change and just being resilient means that we're still relegated to secondary choices. We have to adapt to whatever happens. The number one attribute from all these hundreds of people that we studied of an organization or an individual who is ready for anything is an open mind and a spirit of curiosity. Wow, those are very hard to find. It takes a whole human being who's got great coping skills to have an open mind and a spirit of curiosity as opposed to being driven by the amygdala and fear. I'll also tell you though, that when we're in the middle of this kind of chaos, this is the best time to think about what have you always wanted to try? I'm sure every one of you has thought, you know, we could be doing this better. This is really inefficient. Or this isn't very effective. Or we could be doing this better. We could have, be having more fun doing this. I mean, you name it. Every one of us has had that thought, both about small things and big things like tactics and strategies. The best time to test changes you have always wanted to try is in the middle of chaos when nobody's watching. Now keep in mind, I said test them. Always, always, always pilot test. Calling something a pilot, you can get away with just about anything because the word pilot implies that you're testing something to learn to see how to do it right. Because we can't possibly know in emergencies when we are co-creating we don't know how the end is going to turn out. So we have to study the process as well as the end result. Most organizations still to this day implement ideas full blown all out and have no exit strategy from them. So pilot testing is the way to do it. Always call it a pilot because the word pilot implies we're doing this not only to, to improve, but we're doing it to learn. But it's a really good time to try some stuff. Now, the fifth tool I want to talk about for you about being in front of change has to do with anticipating. Can we be smart enough and ask our brain to do something other than just react or other than just compare to the past? Can we anticipate? Can we ask our brain to leap forward and imagine things? What might be coming? That used to be called scenario planning, but that old scenario planning model is 1950s mentality. We think, oh, what if this happened? That's one thing. And What's the best case, worst case, and likely case? Things don't happen that way anymore. They happen in combination, simultaneously. So only looking at one thing and saying, how are we going to react to that is pretty short-sighted. You see, we can anticipate with this balloon. As soon as the helium runs out, that puppy's gonna drop and it's gonna pop on those nails. Can we anticipate? So <laughs> the only way to be ready for anything is to be ready for anything. One of the ways that we're doing that has to do with a new form of scenario planning. But it's not like your typical, what happened is if this one thing occurs. It's more like a three-dimensional chess game because multiple things might happen at once. They are happening right now simultaneously. And if we only try to solve one of them or analyze one of them, we're going to miss the systemic effects of the others that are happening at the same time. So this is a new model for scenario planning. It's a lot more like three-dimensional chess. Can you imagine playing three different chess games inter integrated with one another? Oh, that looks really complicated, it makes my head hurt. But this scenario planning, first of all, it has to do with 
imagining all the forces that could be coming at you. And from the various different categories of the forces that might be coming at you, and what are the things that might happen in each of these categories? The acronym for is called receipts, which stands for what are the regulatory forces that might change and in what way? The economic forces, the competitive forces, the environmental, the intercultural, the political, the technological, the social, you know, all of these things are being affected right now by the pandemic. I'm going to talk to you about thinking and systems in just a minute. But if you were to make a list in your organization, for example, of what are all the forces that might come at you in the, in the ensuing months and a couple of years or whatever, where, what might the extremes be in terms of how they turn out? And then how might we respond to these things if they happen simultaneously? That's more complicated than all this, but I wanted to give you a kind of flavor for it because it's an easy and actually quite interesting and sometimes sort of a fun activity to think about all this. But the point I want to make is once we have analyzed all the possibilities, that doesn't take very long. You can do this with a group and a half a day. All the possibilities that we think about and then all the possible combinations of these things that can be occurring together. And then what we do is we do a little leap forward. If that is what happens, and of course we've got multiples of these worlds we might live in, if this is the world we end up living in with these things happening, then what is the timid response we will make to this world? And what is the mid-range response we might create? And what is the bold response we might implement? So each world that we look at that we might end up in with all these various forces in combination, we think of three possible options. What's our timid response going to be? What would our mid-range response be? And what would our bold response be? Although you don't know all the details about how to do this, I really want to emphasize something to you. If we prepare this way and think about this, it's a half day exercise for a team or for a large organization. If we plan out three, these three possible options for each of those worlds, what we have found in the research is that if people don't do this preparation, they almost always end up in the timid response. Hence Kodak, for example. Lots of organizations, lots of companies, lots of them right now who have gone out of business or will be going out of business, not because they could help it, but they took a timid response. The mid-range response, of course, and then the bold response, but if they don't have any plan, they're going to choose and end up by default in the timid response. But if we do sit down and think through the possibilities of the worlds we'll end up in and think through the three possible options, that almost always we choose the bold response. Isn't that interesting? If we plan possible responses, we choose bold. If we don't plan, we choose and fall into and default to timid. So interesting things about how human beings tend to respond without some of the new 21st century coping skills. And number six that I wanna to talk to you about is let's use integrated thinking methods for sense-making and co-creation. So thinking systemically, using our whole brain, thinking strategically, these are the kinds of thinking that we need to be merging together so that our brain is really working for us instead of just the fear part, or frankly, just the left hemisphere. So if we were to think about these kinds of thinking, thinking systemically, hmm. traditional thinking is thinking linear from here to here, from A to Z, A, B, C, D, E, and very linear. Systems thinking is about finding the dots, connecting the dots, and making sense out of the connections of the dots. Because we live in interconnected environments in all of our systems, we're finding that we have to pay more attention to the interconnections than just the steps. I would also add that if you look at this slide, you can see that that's left hemisphere and right hemisphere too. So the traditional thinking is right out of our left brain. If we ever doubted the networked concept of degrees of separation and the interconnectedness of everything on this planet, this pandemic has proven it to us. All of the interconnectedness we're just a few degrees of separation from any other human being on this planet, and a virus proves that. The other thing that's really interesting, though, is 
there are other elements of life on this planet that are also integrated and interconnected to this. For example, right now we're changing everything at a faster rate with much more significant interdependencies. Our healthcare system, our economy, our social interaction, all of these kinds of things are now in the interdependencies are showing up. So a system, let me define this for you. It's a group of interacting, interrelated, and, and or interdependent components that form a complex and unified whole. Your physical body is a system. Whole different, all kinds of little different parts do it, but they're all integrated and in making you live, right? Systems can be tangible or intangible. Some are naturally occurring. Some are human made, and some are made of humans. So let's take a look at some that are made of humans. Peter Senge in the fifth discipline, if you haven't read this book, it's one of the best things ever written, where he says the systems thinking is a discipline for seeing holes rather than static snapshots of things and for understanding the subtle interconnectedness that gives living systems their unique character. This is a very powerful way to think. You don't have to have a PhD or even a high school education to understand this. You just have to learn it and imagine it and experience it. Little kids are great at this. They see the interconnectedness of things. But as we move fur further into the 21st century, and as we move beyond the coronavirus, whenever that is going to be, we have to look at the systemic effect of everything we do and everything that's going on. There's some elements of systems. Systems are entities. They will reveal themselves if we listen. Another reason to go to the balcony for a while and take a look around and see what are the patterns in this system. Another really interesting part of systems is that the most flexible part of the system controls the system. It may not even be the most powerful part or the biggest or the most expensive or the more elaborate or the more complex, but the most flexible part of a system controls the system. And if you change one part of the system, the entire system will change. It's a little bit like if you drop a drip of water in a pond and there's a ripple effect. Any change in the system, no matter how small, will have a ripple effect on the whole system. Another reason why we have to be very careful not to build in some bad habits. And the interdependencies in the system, in a human system, tend to be the relationships among human beings. System itself, though, all systems are constantly trying to find equilibrium. They're constantly trying to find balance in themselves. And the problem with that equilibrium, the problem with that balance in your organization is it could be your culture is the, is the equilibrium. Keep in mind that equilibrium sometimes is just taking the path of least resistance. It's just trying to find balance. Doesn't, not effectiveness necessarily, or even efficiency, but just trying to find some balance. And the other thing that's important to know about living systems is that they are always either growing or dying. There's no such thing as stasis in a system. So within our own lives as individuals, within our own organizations or teams, are we actually moving toward growth or are we just moving away from dying? I don't know, but it is up to us. Margaret Wheatley, one of the best leadership gurus who ever, ever lived and has written many, many books are definitely worth reading. But she takes on this issue of equilibrium in organizations that I think is a very healthy take on it. She says, I don't experience equilibrium as an always desirable state. So don't let the system find its own equilibrium, help it find a more effective equilibrium. She says, I don't believe it's a desired state for an organization. Quite the contrary. I've observed the search for organizational equilibrium is a sure path to institutional death, a road to zero trafficked by fearful people. So we're not, we're in seeking balance and comfort, we may be honestly putting our systems into a perilous place. Maybe we need to get comfortable with the discomfort. Now there's some systems in nature that I think make wonderful examples. I don't know if you know this about aspen groves. There's a grove of aspen trees in Utah that has been around for over a million years, but the aspen grove is a wonderful concept all by itself. Did you know that aspens are all one root system? 
with individual trees popping up above the ground, but underneath the ground, it's all one root system. This is fascinating to me. And what an incredible metaphor for human beings. What an incredible metaphor for an organization where what if we all operated as if we are one root system with individual trees popping up and they all look different and but they are interacting with each other differently. Most trees have their own root system. So you go into a forest, you, every time you see a tree, you pretty much see a tree with its own root system. But aspen are different. Isn't that beautiful? What a thought, what a metaphor. So the considerations of systems and thinking in systems, we have to pay attention to the interdependencies. One thing we're moving in the direction of that we absolutely must move in the direction is away from silos, more toward horizontal leadership and horizontal decision-making not just vertical. Because if we ignore the interdependencies amongst the silos, something's gonna, something's gonna break, something's gonna get missed, something's gonna fall through the cracks, something's gonna get duplicated. But the communication and the inter, of the, amongst and between the interdependencies is critical today. We have to figure this out, my friends. We can't leave this alone and leave the world siloed. Also recognizing that the interventions, any intervention we make will shift the system. So where's the best place to intervene in a system to make it healthier? Any, because any change in the system will change the system. I will tell you some interesting studies done by Donella Meadows, who's write, written a lot of wonderful work about systems. She has found that the best place to intervene in a system to really shift the system in a healthy and comprehensive way that is also uh, sustainable is to intervene at the level of mindset, not at the level of task or the level of strategy or the level of planning or at the level of resources or anything else that the best place to intervene in a system is at the level of mindset. It's more sustainable. Also pattern detection and sense making in a system. Part of our job as leaders is to get up in that balcony and look for the patterns and make sense out of what's really going on. Most of the time we see symptoms, but we can't fix a symptom. That makes no sense because if you only fix a symptom, it's going to pop up somewhere else. What you want to do is solve at the root of whatever is going on, but you can't do that unless you're in the balcony seeing and finding the patterns and doing the sense making about them. And then paying attention to the ripple effects. Every single solitary thing that we do has a ripple effect and has the potential for some serious unintended consequences. If we could start thinking that way, it's just a little bit, you know, a rewiring the brain. It's not rocket science, but on the other hand, this is how rocket science works. So thinking in terms of systems is one of the ways to integrate thinking. And the other kind of thinking that we want to integrate into systems thinking is whole brain thinking. I love this graphic about our right hemisphere is interested in music and art and it's not linear, it's very non-linear and all kinds of really interesting things and pleasure and so on. The left, on the other hand, is very linear. It's mathematical. It, it is based on uh, thinking in, that is pretty much something like an engineer might do is put all this together, but the right brain is who invented what the engineer is going to do. We have access to a whole brain. I would tell you I would be terrified if I ever found out the answer to this question, but I'm pretty sure in working in industry for many, many, many years now that most of the thinking that goes on at work is linear. And when I tell you that the number one resource we have available to us today is innovation, that means that we're not learning to use our brain in order to get where we need to get. So using the whole brain thinking is really important. One of the ways that we do this is very fun. We go into organizations and ask them to build structures, three-dimensional structures. It depends on what question you want to ask. In this case, they were building a three-dimensional structure to demonstrate or to exemplify the way they thought communication should work inside their organization. You can build structures on how you think your organization should be in the future. Uh, when we do this with large groups of people, we have half of them, we have them all sitting at small, small tables with four or five at each table. Half of the group does the way the organization has been, and the other half does the way the organization could or should be in vast imaginable. And then we make the comparison across the two sets of these things. These are called metaphors. 
And you ask a question and let people build a three-dimensional structure that exemplifies the answer to the question. And this is one table. Here's another table answering the same question. Here's another table answering the same question. And then we put all these ideas together. They're generated by the whole brain, not just the left brain. And the structure itself really does tell the story about what people are thinking and hoping for. The comparison between the past and the future is really powerful. One of the fun things about this exercise is that we have everybody get up and go to each table and the table describes their own form, their own metaphor, and why, it's, why it is the way it is and what story it is telling. But the people who didn't build it are also looking at it and they can see things that the people who built it didn't even see that are good answers or potential pieces of information for moving forward. This is breaking through. It may seem silly, but this is some of the best breakthrough thinking that's going on today. It doesn't take anything but a little pipe cleaner, some glue, some you know, Play-Doh. It actually really works. Great tool for, for uh, problem solving when it's a gnarly problem and you haven't got a clue how to solve it too. So the, other, the third kind of thinking that we want to integrate into what I would call mental discipline is strategic thinking. And strategic thinking has some elements that are absolute. You cannot think strategically unless you think in terms of from the future back to today, from the big picture to small picture, from strategy to tactics, and most importantly, from outside in. That's strategic thinking. If you do any of those things the other way around, it's tactical thinking, and the brain doesn't work that way. The brain is much more flexible if you start with big picture questions and then ask it to winnow down to something smaller or to ask it about the future and then move it back to today. The brain is more whole brain and it works better if you start from big to small, future to present and outside in. Measured it, you can see it on brain waves and everything. So that puts into question something that we've been using for a really long time that I want to suggest you stop doing because the brain doesn't even do this very well. Any of you know the SWOT analysis, S-W-O-T analysis? Stop doing that. You're not using your brain right. It was invented a gazillion years ago and it was great at the time, but now we've learned some more things about how people think and how the brain works. You should use, actually be using OTSWO instead of SWAT. Here's the reason why. SWAT stands for strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. The strengths and weaknesses we look at first, and that's our internal strengths and weaknesses. Then the opportunities and threats we look at second, which is what's going on in the external environment. So we do an internal scan first and then an external scan. The brain doesn't work that way. You have to start outside in, big picture to small, future to present, which means you'd have to be doing uh, opportunities, threats, strengths, weaknesses, and then go back to opportunities. The worst thing you can do is analyze yourselves internally first and then try to figure out how it's gonna fit into the external world because we're not using our brains well. It's sort of like if you're evaluating yourselves and you make buggy whips and your strengths and weaknesses Obvious. Your strength is you're the best buggy whip maker in the world, and your weaknesses are that you don't quite have very fancy machinery to be doing this. The problem is if you then look at the opportunities and threats, it's a little too late because you didn't realize nobody's buying buggy whips anymore. So think outside in. Always think outside in. It doesn't matter if you're the government or a nonprofit or a for profit or what you do for a living, always outside in because. And any work that we do, we are somehow serving others. So figure them out first and then figure out what your internal scan is. Which means also I would say, now this is a little controversial, I know, but I'm suggesting that we're talking about strategic thinking, not strategic planning. The Stanford Social Innovation Review, which is one of the best journals you can read today, it's not just regurgitating the past. It's a fantastic journal. But I think it was in 2011 or somewhere in there that they wrote, published an article called Strategic Thinking is Dead, Long Live Strategy. 
I wholeheartedly agree with that. Having taught strategy for many years, I wholeheartedly agree with that. Strategic planning really is not very viable anymore. You can set your overall goals and then figure out your strategy for getting there. But to bother with all the milestones and all that kind of stuff, we used to put together five and 10 year plans, if you can believe that. You can't even put together a one year and 18 month plan anymore. And you couldn't do that before the coronavirus either. So what you do is figure out a strategy, figure out your ultimate goals. You figure out your strategy to get there. And then you do a 12 to 18 month work plan, not a strategic plan. And the reason for that is strategic planning is not flexible. It does not allow a nimble enough document to adapt to the changes that happened that we didn't see coming. So most strategic plans, as you well know, and people have been saying for over 10 years, are sitting on a shelf somewhere gathering dust. So strategy, long live strategy. So strategic thinking is the how you get to strategy. Gary Hamill, another one of the fantastic writers, uh, really good work that he has done over the years, says the single biggest reason companies fail is, whoops, sorry, fail is that they overinvest in what is as opposed to investing in what might be. And those might. We're afraid to invest in stuff that we don't know if it's going to be concrete or specific or real or not. That's crazy. What we need to do is invest in what might be, and now is the time. And I'm not talking just about investing money. I'm talking about investing the time people are putting in at work. Most of the organizations I know right now, the people are working virtually, some from home, some in the office and whatever, but they're still trying to figure out how to do the old work. And I'm suggesting we need to be using a significant amount of that time trying to imagine the future and investing in what might be. I'm doing that with some very exciting and very high profile organizations right now. And one of the things that has been beautiful is that people are starting to show up in their anxiety and their fear and their angst and their depression over this coronavirus, that we've actually lifted their spirits by doing this too. Once they latch into this, they sort of like it. Which takes me then to the last point in terms of the tools I want to help us think about and some things we can try. And I think in some ways, this is the most important one of all. In fact, if we do this first, all the others will help fall into place. Let's start shifting our focus and our choices more toward meaning, meaningfulness, and purpose. And I'm talking about as individuals, and I'm also talking about as organizations. You know, why are we here? There's some really interesting questions, and most people, as they get a little deeper into their lives, start thinking about, why am I here? You know, what am I doing here? It's a really interesting question. You won't land on it at any one particular time. It shifts over time. But you have to have it. Otherwise, without this, without a purpose, without a noble purpose, without meaningfulness about what we do and who we are, without that, we have no context and no foundation within which to make our choices. So our choices might stack up, but they're not going to add up. Without meaning and purpose, we're building elaborate houses on sand. Now, I'm not talking about your mission and your vision and all that kind of stuff. I wish we'd just throw that stuff out with the strategic plans because everybody's doing it. The intention of a mission and purpose statement was to tell the outside world about us. I'm talking about meaning and purpose that we talk to each other inside about. Why do we exist? What is our noble purpose? For whom do we exist? And you can put that down if you want. You can say, oh, everybody knows that. No, we're not using that as a platform to build every single solitary day of work. What we have to be doing is figuring this kind of stuff out and talking to each other and making it the main driver of our choices. A colleague of mine, Matt Michael Chavez at Duke, corporate education has just written a book on this and it's absolutely fantastic. It's talking about bringing, rehumanizing leadership and rehumanizing organizations. Just came out and it's worth reading because it's about why we show up at work is much more meaningful to us and we are much more engaged if we have a particular reason why we're there besides just doing the job and getting a paycheck. 
and, and we have to be constantly reminded of why we're there. We did this at a university not too long ago where it's an education institution, right? So everybody there is an educator. In one form or another, if our purpose is to educate, then everybody there is an educator. So we did a little workshop on work as self-expression. And everybody in the whole system had to sit down and say, what did their job do to add up to helping educate people? And the folks who pushed the brooms in the middle of the night had to come up with, they are educators. So what is it that they do that adds up to helping people be educated? Once they saw how they fit into the grand scheme of things and how their contribution really helped make, achieve the overall purpose, their eyes just lit up and they were so happy about, I'm an educator too. Well, by golly, you are. And if you didn't do your job, I can't do mine. The contributions have to add up and not just feel like they stack up. And people's well-being and their sense of self goes way higher. It's a good time to do this when people are feeling anxious and unhappy. It's a good time to start looking at purpose. Anytime we look at something that's bigger than we are, it's probably a good thing. So the big questions that you'd ask about purpose and meaningfulness, in what way is the contribution your organization makes meaningful? How does it make things or people better in the long run? Why does it matter? To whom does it matter? How is it a form of self-expression to you? Why do you do what you do? And elevate your answer to a higher purpose. I think you'll be able to take a breath of fresh air and go, oh yeah, this does feel like it makes a difference, like it matters. Those are the big conversations we should be having with people right now. Instead of how do you handle yourself by working virtually, we should be talking to each other about why we matter in the first place. So I'll add this to the, we're starting to study systems and natural systems to see if we can't learn something from them. And one of the systems that we started to study, the scientists have been studying, is animals, creatures, birds, for example. And how is it that these crit critters can do better than we as humans do when their brains are the size of a peanut, they don't have opposing thumbs, and they can't use verbal abstract language, which makes us higher level creatures, right? Not necessarily, because they've been studying how flocks of birds are able to demonstrate amazing coordination and alignment without brains the size of ours, without opposing thumbs, or without abstract language. Birds, for example, with thousands of interdependent, independent bodies that move as one interdependent body, reacting together in nanoseconds to changes in geography, topography, wind currents, and potential predators. They're ready for anything. They're not just trying to be resilient. They're in front of things and making decisions all the time to keep themselves together and to survive. So, the scientists have discovered that there are sort of three rules that govern this interaction. Number one, maintain a minimum distance from your neighbor. Number two, fly at the same speed as your neighbor. And number three, always, all birds turn towards the center. So think about this, maintain a minimum distance. Well, right now it needs to be about six feet apart. But minimum distance is not necessarily physical distance. You know, social distancing does not mean social disconnecting. In fact, it should mean more connecting because of the social distancing. Fly at the same speed as your neighbor means that some of us may need to speed up, but some of us also might need to slow down. And always turn towards the center. Interesting point. So my question to you in your organization is, what might your center be? So let me show you a little video here. Again, I bring you this from Sacramento because it's a beautiful example of what birds will do. Look what they can do that we can't. So if you were to ask yourself then, so ask yourself, what might your center be? In your entire organization, what might your center be? And get people on the same page with that. 
so that you have a stable foundation upon which to do your work. So I will remind you one more time, this is the time. If you want to test something out, you want to try something out, now is the time. And try it to improve and make things better than they were before and test out some stuff you've always wanted to try, but always pilot test because it's too risky to just implement without testing. So as I conclude, I want to point out to you, we're talking about seeding the future. And what Nancy Levin says, honor the space between the no longer and the not yet. Let's use this time as if there's a pony in there somewhere. Thinking about that the world will be different. So let's be ready for it. Even if we don't know what it's going to look like, let's be ready for whatever that might be. The problem is human nature tends to default to what is and not what could be. So my advice is to aim for best imaginable. My friend Peter Wilton at Berkeley made that up, phrase up, and I love that, aim for best imaginable. And start right now creating that and planning that. Build your organization from the ground up on a clean piece of paper and build it in perfect best imaginable and see how it's different than the way it was maybe. But being human has always been a bit perilous. So let's be really honest with, with ourselves and each other. We need to be, learn to be realistic, effective, harmonious, and happy in this world of Vuja day, meaning that feeling that creeps over you that you've never been anywhere like this before. Thank you, George Carlin. And we need to be, be ready, and being proactive means creating the world the way we always hoped it would be. Femme Chodron, who is a Tibetan nun, was asked recently by some folks and said, help us, help us, because we feel so ungrounded. Can you help us at least feel, get our footing and feel grounded again? And she said, the illusion, my friends, is that you were ever grounded in the first place. This is a perilous place. We're human. Stuff happens. And we need to build a different set and a healthier set of coping skills. And we need to do it together. So, at a certain point, I wanted to grow some stuff because I didn't want to keep going to the grocery store because I try to be careful about that. And I wanted some fresh herbs because they don't, they wilt and they don't last very long. And I didn't want to keep going back to the grocery store. So I found this little herb garden from a wonderful small company on the internet called Spade to Fork. And they sent me this wonderful little kit to grow my own herbs. It is the cutest thing you ever saw. This is a husband and wife organization that I think is somewhere, somewhere in the South. I'm not sure. And they put this cute thing together. Boy, talk about people who found their purpose. But it came with a quote, this cute little kit that's even got dirt that you pour water on it and the dirt swells up and you plant these cute little seeds. And it's a wonderful thing. But it came with a quote that came with this little package that really inspired me, especially right now in this land of between the no longer and the not yet. Here's my little herb garden, by the way. Look at how they're growing. Aren't they just gorgeous? Look at these guys. So happy. The quote that came with it, it's a quote from Audrey Hepburn when she said, to plant a garden is to believe in tomorrow. Think about that. Both literally, like my little garden that I am growing, of course I believe in tomorrow. Why, why would I bother planting some seeds if I didn't think they were going to grow and I could eat them? But figuratively, to plant a figurative garden, now, set your intentions is to believe in tomorrow, too. All the things I've talked to you about today have to do with let's start planning and implementing and imagining and hoping for tomorrow. That's a different kind of planting seeds and set your intentions. So my question to you before you leave me is, what seed will you plant this week? And think about it. What seed will you plant this week that will be leaping forward toward the future as opposed to being stuck back in the past. And here's a seed I want to plant for you about keeping perspective. I love this quote. I know many of you are feeling kind of a lot of anxiety and angst and depression and cabin fever and all kinds of stuff out there. So this may just fall on deaf ears, but if it doesn't, think about this for a second. Just think in terms of life's not about waiting for the storm to pass. It's about learning to dance in the rain. So with that, I just want to wrap up and tell you thank you for being with me today. Please be safe out there, be sane out there, and let's start looking toward tomorrow. We don't have to be afraid of it, but we certainly, if we're in front of it, we can help shape the way it's going to turn out to be. 
instead of just defaulting to what happens and then just adapting to it. We have our capacity amongst us as human beings. Let's use it. Thank you and let me know how we can help. My information, if you want, is on the first slide. If you want copies of these slides, I'd be happy to send them to you. But goodbye, good luck, and stay safe and sane.